serves as an advisor to the Anti-Terrorism Caucus in the U.S. House and uh, a number of other things. And he is the uh, he briefs and test, uh, testifies before Congress, European Parliament, and the United Nations Security Councils on matters relating to uh, international security in the Middle East conflict. And he is the uh, go-to expert person on Fox News Channel. Uh, regarding Middle East and terrorism. So, uh, Dr. Walid uh, Ferez, uh, thanks for being back with us today on the Conservative Command Radio Show. Well, thank you very much for having me on your great show. Thank you. I'd like to get right into this because uh, this is an area of expert knowledge for you, and it's something that we like to inform our listeners on on a regular basis, and that is what's going on in the Middle East. Uh, my, my first question I'm going to pose to you is that uh, the events in the last few days uh, that surround the fall of Fallujah and Ramadi in Iraq to me confirms a, a very disastrous reality, and it seems that Iraq is in a critical position now, perhaps uh, even for survival, as we know it, as a country. In your opinion, with al-Qaeda now in control of these two key cities, what stops them from turning all of Iraq into a al-Qaeda beachhead in the Middle East? Let me begin by saying that, uh, you know, Al-Qaeda controlled these two cities. It is expected, if not stopped, that the jihadist allies of Al-Qaeda, Al-Qaeda can expand to other Sunni cities. So the maximum Al-Qaeda could do is to establish an emirate, like a Waziristan uh, area under its control in most of Iraq's Sunni areas. I don't think Al-Qaeda would be able to go into the Shia areas, otherwise there will be a very, very nasty war. But having said that, my friend, I'd say that the, one of the strategic reasons for why Iraq is looking at, as it is right now, meaning jihad is coming back to the Sunni Triangle after all what we've done for 10 years, and the Iranians penetrating Iraq, is about the way we left Iraq. When we were in Iraq, with all the mistakes and every other problem, we have been able to partner with Sunni moderate elements, uh, at Sahwa, for example, in the same areas of Fallujah and Anbar, and they have pushed back against al-Qaeda. It was defeated. And in the other areas of Iraq, we had the Kurds, we had the Christians, we had moderate Shias. The way we left Iraq in 2011, we transferred power to Maliki, who is very close from Iran. It exacerbated the, uh, the Sunnis, and therefore al-Qaeda came back. So it really has to do also about you know, our own policy, the way we dealt with Iraq at the end. That's interesting, because I want to take some of my next question. There, there, are, there are a lot of guys, um, uh, like John McCain, as an example, are saying, hey, I told you so in response to uh, Obama removing, as he would say, too many troops too quickly and creating this void, almost as an invitation for al-Qaeda to come into Iraq. But in, in this scenario... I want to broaden this question a little bit and say we could say that uh, there was too uh, there was too a complete and abrupt pull out of American forces out of Iraq and offered almost an invitation for Al Qaeda to come in. But on the other hand, which is more of the cause of this whole thing that that the, that that policy or does it go all the way back to to the fact of perhaps maybe Saddam Hussein uh, actually provided some balance of power, and maybe the problem started with taking him out, even though he was a bad guy, maybe he was a better bad guy in some respects. Where does the problem really begin here? Because it helps, I think, without knowing this, yeah. it kind of helps to tell us where to go in the future. What's your view on that? Neither one or the other. We have, you know, as Americans, we're always put into, you know, the position to choose between something bad and something worse. You know, like in, in Syria, for example, I don't want to anticipate, oh, we have Assad and then we have Al-Qaeda. Yes, but we put ourselves in this position. In the case of Iraq, Saddam was certainly bad for the Iraqi people. He had done in the past many things that were not in the interest of the West. Taking him down or out was a good thing to do. But the question would have been what to do once that is done meaning who to prepare to take over. So the mistake has been, uh, first of all, at the end of the occupation of Iraq, at the time where we were able to plan, you know, to plan a partnership with Shia moderates led by Alawi. Alawi was the former prime minister of Iraq. He was a moderate. He actually won most elections. Yet, because we had a deal with the Iranians, and this is where I'm coming for the second scenario, the I told you so, because many of our good lawmakers are telling President Obama, we told you so, but they don't provide the actual alternative. We told you so what? That we're going to keep our troops forever? We cannot do that. So it would have been a situation whereby bringing down Saddam, 
partnering with Sunni moderates, partnering with Shia moderates. We have the Kurds with us and the Christians are with us, creating a coalition and then remitting Iraq to that coalition. What has happened is that the Obama policy was, I am going to withdraw from Iraq without doing any architecture. Obviously, you are going to get to the point where Iranians and al-Qaeda are going to be in. So the last part of our strategy in Iraq, the one to consolidate an ally and to leave, because we had to leave at one point, that was not done, unfortunately. Well, that, that brings us then here to the next step. As we look at what was done there, we got out. There are, I thought, what are, there are like 3,000 American soldiers on the ground right now or something of that small number, which basically is enough to almost protect themselves, nothing else, in my opinion. But, but nonetheless, you've got that small knot there. I at least thought that we were, the U.S., that is, was maintaining at least uh, superiority in the airspace over Iraq. Then I thought I read something the other day where we are actually, we gave that up too. Is that correct? Yeah. Who controls the airspace over Iraq right now? No, no, we, we gave up everything. Look, there was an agreement, an initial agreement with the previous government in Iran that we're going to maintain some sort of a NATO-like alliance with the government that would remain behind us in Iraq. That would have been the, the most strategic choice that we would have done. So if Al-Qaeda will come back, we can coordinate with them as we would coordinate with the British or with the Greeks or with the Turks or something. Had Iraq been maintained as an ally to the United States, then we may not have to always keep 60, 70,000. We have our 3,000, and when needed from the Gulf, we could you know, bring them over. What we have done, the biggest mistake, was to allow a government that is an ally to Iran to take over from us and then... We don't have any access to the space, airspace. We don't have any access to anything else except with their permission. And they coordinate with whom? With the Iranians. But the double fault was that not only we gave it to a pro-Iranian regime, that regime did not even seek any sort of a good policy with the Sunni, inviting the al-Qaeda to come back. So now we have two bad guys in Iraq, not one. So in reality, are you saying that is, is it Iran that, if, that effectively controls airspace over Iraq right now because of the scenario? Theoretically, yes. There are reports, uh, our listeners can Google that very easily, that says two things. Number one, that the Iranians are overflying Iraq with the approval of the Iraqi government with their own forces, but Iran, from Iran to Syria. That, Iraqi that, that, airspace... That's, be- that, that's, that's incredible. To me, that's yes, incredible. incredible. And I found that yes. out that, lo and behold, I at least thought... I think most American people think that at least there's a base of operation there, because at some point in not too distant past, uh, when uh, when Israel was talking about uh, some months yeah. ago talking about having to you know go into Iran, there was some discussion back then. Where the U.S. said that they weren't going to give them some kind of uh, flyover ability. So uh, when did this come about? Effectively, that Iran took primacy in the skies of Iraq. De facto, after we withdrew the last operational units in December of 2011. Remember. In 2011, we had that first discussion during the presidential campaign. In 2012, uh, you know, one campaign was accusing the administration of letting go of Iraq completely to the Iranians. And then now in 2013, last year and now, the Iranians have flown, uh, you know, jets, uh, not jets, I mean uh, planes with, with soldiers and ammunition into Syria. So now look, look at the big picture. The Iranian airspace is connected to the Iraqi airspace, to the Syrian airspace, to the Lebanese Hezbollah-controlled airspace. So if you want to factor in Israel, it's not that Israel cannot overfly Iraq anymore. It's that Iranian assets, anti-aircraft missiles, can be deployed from Iran to northern Israel. Just look at the map and see how important, how, how dangerous was what we've done in Iraq. Okay, this, 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 this is an amazing thing. Let's take this in. We've got about two minutes before the break here, so let's get this other question in I want to ask you. In, in regard to the Iranian increased involvement and presence, in Iraq we're talking about, but, but a lot of the Middle East here. Did yeah. Barack Obama, in the negotiation, disastrous negotiation, in my opinion, is what, what happened with them, did, did he increase and give them effectively negotiation rights in settling the civil war in Syria? Does, is that also happening where they have a legitimate, illegitimate, but official strengthened hand in in, in Syria as a result of that negotiation? Well, a few days ago, my friend, uh, there was a statement by our Secretary of State, and then he, he tried to change it later on, saying Iran can or could have a role in Geneva II talks. What do you mean by it can have a role? This has nothing to do with Iran. It has to do with Syria. So it's an indirect invitation to the Iranian regime 
to come and support the, the Assad regime in the negotiations and talks in Geneva. So if you read it on, on, on a global scale, what we have done through the so-called nuclear deal is spared Assad, spare the Iranian regime, stop the sanctions, give the Iranian regime a green light against its own opposition, and de facto, de facto recognize Iranian power in the region from Beirut to Tehran. That's the meaning, the practical meaning. See, see that's, that's incredible. Dr. Uh, Ferris, can you stay with us to the break here, please? Yes, sir. Dr. Ferris, I was watching you this morning on foxnews.com, and I'll, let me tell you what was going through my mind, and you tell me if I'm right or wrong. That what is happening now in Iraq reminds me of what happened in Vietnam. In the haste of a politician, in this case Barack Obama, to end the war politically, because that's what he campaigned on, that we have now wasted thousands of lives and about a trillion dollars in treasure. And that the result here in Iraq is going to look very similar to our results in Vietnam we walked out, and our enemies walk right in. You know, uh, not only you're right, but it's, it's even more, more dramatic than that, if I may add. Uh, in Vietnam, uh, America lost Vietnam, you know, and, and Indochina. Uh, well, that would be with Laos and, and Cambodia, but it stopped there. What we're talking about here is that al-Qaeda is coming back to Iraq and from Iraq into Syria from Syria and to Saudi Arabia, we need always to look towards the potential expansion. And that is going to cost us probably in the future, probably, I'm saying, and hopefully not, another intervention to help the Saudis and the Kuwaitis and the UAE from a potential al-Qaeda penetration. So that's number one. So we're not out of there completely because of that. Threat. Number two, it's costing us Iran penetrating in the Shia areas of Iraq, in Syria, in Hezbollah, probably in Bahrain and some other uh, places. So the failure in Iraq is, is, is of a much bigger magnitude because it's a failure across the region. And I would add one thing, not to depress us, those are listening. This is not over. Mm. This year, we are going to be repeating the same scenario. The administration is dead set on withdrawing our forces from Afghanistan. And I don't want to begin to tell you what will be the consequences of the return of the Taliban. So it's really about Washington going in the very wrong strategic direction. Was there an end game that could have worked? For instance, I heard some thoughts uh, right before the surge in Iraq that maybe a solution would have been to separate Iraq into three separate countries, one by the, run by the Sunnis, one by the Kurds, the other by the Shiites. Could that have been a solution? Also, I wanted to ask you, Saddam Hussein was a dictator, a very vicious man, and that whenever anyone who would potentially be a threat to him showed up, he had them eliminated. So when we eliminated him, there was no, real, no one really left in Iraq who was strong enough, who was smart enough to hold that country together. That is a little bit naive. I'm going to explain why. We like the strong man in Hollywood movies, and they can do that, but that's not eternal. Remember, Saddam Hussein, even if not crumbled by us, he could have been killed, and, you know, oh, God, how many enemies he had. Maybe by his own son. There could have been a coup d'etat. There could have been, you know, a, a, a Shia Kurdish uprising against him. So compared to now, to the instability of now, we tend always to look, oh, okay, what was before? He was a strong man. He killed everybody. But he was a loose cannon. He could have at any point allied uh, himself with Syria and Iran against us if he didn't get what he wanted from us. I'm, I'm not here to say that the, we did the right thing at the right time. I had probably a different alternative to engage in the Middle East. But now that Saddam was out in 2003, Certainly, because we were on the ground, because we, have our, we had our own troops and we had spent so much money, maybe too much money, we could have done much more in a cheaper way. We could have partnered directly instead of going through a central government in Baghdad. And, I, and I'm going to be very close to what you said, but in a different way. We could have worked with three forces in Iraq, not one, three. The Kurds are there. We work with them. They have the little Kurdistan. That who will protect the Christians, by the way, 1.5 million Christians, they won't be butchered as they have done. 
we would work, and we have worked with the Sunni tribes of Asahwa in the Sunni Triangle, empowered them, had their own local government, and done the same with many, many Shia uh, in the South who dislike the Iranians. Instead, we have subcontracted the whole of Iraq to the pro-Iranians. That was a big mistake. Yes, we could have left behind us a federal Iraq with three strong provinces. Each one of them would have been our ally. We didn't have a good architecture, unfortunately, in Washington, D.C., for that matter. Dr. Ferris, I'll ask one more question, and then I'll throw it back to Sam. And this is a hard one, but now what's the end game? This is a real hard question. The problem is that uh, w w when we mess up so much and then we bring it to the surgeon, you know, the doctors were not able to do it, and now we're going to have to bring it back to the surgeon. And this is how I would answer that one. I would tell you this. With this administration, with this policy, no matter what you do, you're not going to win because they don't want to do it. It's really about Washington. Forget about the region. If you can reform the State Department, if you can convince the administration to change direction, then I would have for you a lot of answers. But what would be the value of me giving answers and alternatives if this administration is not going to go that way? They will not let go of their alliance or their potential partnership with the Iranian regime. If we don't change that, forget about any solution. In Iraq. They are not going to let go of their partnership with the Muslim Brotherhood to such a point that the, Muslim, that the, the people of Egypt rose against U.S. policy, against U.S. official policy. So first, what we need to do is stop, look at Washington, have a dialogue with the administration and tell them, guys, your policy is not working. You need to have a bipartisan uh, commission to look over the, the, this policy and change it. From there on, you could get a lot of answers. Well, Dr. Ferry, this is Sam. I'm going to jump back in here now at this point. And continuing on that, but the further policies that we're getting from this administration, of, of the Secretary uh, of State <clears throat> is, is over there now trying to forge this peace treaty between the Palestinians and, and Israel. And I think I, I, I just read that even the, uh, even the Arab population within Israel says they do not want to live under any kind of a Palestinian rule. This seems to further complicate everything that's going on here. Speak to me on what this is doing uh, in conjunction with all of these other changes that are happening in Syria and uh, in, in Iraq with, uh, with Iran coming on stronger. What's, what's really happening here? Look, the Obama administration, since day one, I'm saying 09, have been arguing, and that was the influence of many academics who have been arguing even before them, that issue, that if we solve the Arab-Israeli conflict, the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, the entire Middle East will go in a great direction. Well, the Arab Spring came to proof that most of the Arabs, not just inside Israel, the Israeli Arabs, in Egypt, in Iraq, in Syria, in Sudan, in Libya, their first priority is not the Arab-Israeli conflict. I mean, with all our respect and, you know, love for peace between Arabs and Israelis, but you have something going on in Syria. Ravaging, 200,000 people have been killed. In Iraq, we see the beginning of it. Lebanon with all these assassinations. And Egypt with the rule of the Muslim Brotherhood. My point is, all these trips, all these voyages, journeys by our Secretary of State, the current one the previous one, they've been going back and forth and back and forth. They meet with the head of the PA, and then they meet with the, the Prime Minister of Israel, and then they come to the media. How many times you could collect on Google, maybe a hundred times, that we are making progress, and no progress is being made because they don't want to face reality. Reality is that the problem facing the peace process between Israeli and Palestinians is neither one. It's the Iranian Hezbollah support of Hamas. As long as you have Hamas and Gaza armed and it can sink every single attempt of the peace process, you're not going to have a peace process. So my recommendation has been, has been to Congress, first, Work with the Israelis, work with the moderate Palestinians to solve the issue of Gaza. And once you have that solution, then you can sit down and start to negotiate a serious a serious. And Dr. Uh, and Dr. Ferres, thank I think we're going to wrap it up at that point. Work with the Israelis and work with our other friends that are there in order to come home with something that's workable. We're going to have to leave here right now, but I want you to give our listeners uh, where to go to follow more of what you are writing, your blogs, and other information that you're putting out. Putting out. Well, thank you so much for this opportunity. It's a great show. Uh, people, listeners can come simply to my website. They need to spell my name right, W-A-L-I-D, that's Walid Ferris, P-H-A-R-E-S dot com. Walid Ferris dot com, you get to my website, to my Facebook, to my Twitter, to my books, and you will be happy.